Multivariable Calculus Section 12.9 Lagrange Multipliers So here's what Wikipedia has to say about Lagrange multipliers. In mathematical optimization, the method of Lagrange multipliers, named after Joseph Louis Lagrange, is a strategy for finding maxima and minima of a function subject to equality constraints. So, for example, the red surface has a maximum up there at the top of that red hill. But if we want to know the maximum constrained to the blue plane, then that's another kettle of fish entirely. The maximum of the surface on the blue uh, plane is different. So there's a picture of Louis Lagrange. You may remember him from the infamous Lagrange remainder theorem that everyone knows and loves. And I thought we'd uh, stop for just a moment and have a little bit of mathematical history. Joseph Louis Lagrange, born Giuseppe Luigi Lagrancia, on the 25th of January, 1736, in Turin, Piedmont, died 10th of April, 1813, in Paris, was an Italian Enlightenment-era mathematician and astronomer. He made significant contributions to all fields of analysis, number theory, and both classical and celestial mechanics. Now, analysis is an umbrella that includes calculus, so he was also an expert in calculus. On the recommendation of Euler and D'Alembert in 1766, Lagrange succeeded Euler as the director of mathematics at the Prussian Academy of Sciences in Berlin, Prussia, where he stayed for over 20 years, producing a large body of work and winning several prizes of the French Academy of Science. Lagrange's treatise on analytical mechanics written in Berlin and first published in 1788, offered the most comprehensive treatment of classical mechanics since Newton and formed a basis for the development of mathematical physics in the 19th century. In 1787, at the age of 51, he moved from Berlin to Paris and became a member of the French Academy. He remained in France until the end of his life. He became the first professor of analysis at the École Polytechnique upon its opening in 1794, founding member of the Bureau de Longitude and senator in 1799. So quite an accomplished fellow. So now we're going to talk about extrema. We already know that extrema can only occur on the interior of a plane region where all, all partial derivatives are zero or equivalently the gradient vector is a null vector or else where at least one of the partial derivatives is undefined. But sometimes we need to find extrema when there are additional constraints. In this situation, Lagrange multipliers can help. So here's the big theorem for this section. Lagrange multipliers with one constraint. Let f of x, y, and g of x, y be continuous differentiable functions. And if a minimum or maximum of uh, the function f subject to the constraints of g equals 0 occurs at p, and if the gradient at p is not the null vector, then, here's the biggie, the gradient of f at p is equal to lambda times the gradient of g at p for some constant lambda. And the proof of this is in your book should you care to read it. So now let's talk about how we use this theorem. Method for a surface in three space, z equals f of x, y, a function of two variables. If the gradient of f at p equals lambda times the gradient of g at p, then we're going to have four equations in four variables, namely the original function equation, the fact that the um, partial derivative with respect to x is equal to lambda times the partial derivative with respect to g, the partial derivative of f with respect to y is equal to lambda, same lambda, times the partial derivative of g with respect to y, and then we have, our, we set our g function equal to zero. So there's four equations and four unknowns, namely x, y, z, and lambda.
Now note that the value of lambda is usually of little interest. If we find it in the middle of our solving, fine, but usually it just kind of drops out of the whole deal. Now the method for uh, in four space for w equal function of three variables x, y, and z is similar. If the gradient of f at p equals lambda times the gradient of g at p, then we have five equations in five variables, the original function, and then the three partial derivatives, and then of course our g function set equal to zero. And again, the value of lambda is uh, unimportant and usually of little interest, and sometimes we don't even bother solving for that. Now that goes on, of course, if we're in five space or six space. You can just keep on adding the number of equations and unknowns, and of course the algebra gets worse and worse. So the problems in your text have to be fairly uh, simple. And out in the real world, if you've got lots and lots of variables, then we use computers these days to solve those systems. Now we have an extended theorem, Lagrange multipliers with n constraints. Let's say you have your function that you want to maximize and your constraints, you have n constraints, g, g functions, and they all have to be continuous and differentiable. And if a minimum or maximum of f subject to the, the, the n constraints, um, all set equal to zero, occurs at point p, and none of the constraint uh, gradients are the null vector, then the gradient of f at p is equal to the sum of the uh, constraint gradients, each multiplied by a different lambda. But those constants have to exist according to Louis Lagrange. Now, as you can imagine, then, um, when you have lots of constraints and you're in three space or four space or whatever, the algebra of solving these systems can get ridiculously difficult. And that's where computers come in handy. In this text, we will only do uh, problems that are kind of set up to be easy to solve. So I don't have nightmares. This, this little puppet had a nightmare that she had to solve 50 equations with 50 unknowns. But don't worry, that's not going to happen in the exercises. So now we're going to start looking at the problems. Number two, find the absolute extreme of this function subject to the constraint x squared plus 4y squared equals 1. So it's the the highest point on the plane f that is also on the um, cylinder x squared plus 4y squared equals 1. So notice that our g function then, we'd have to bring the 1 over technically, but that's when we take the derivatives, the 1 goes to 0 anyway. So the partial derivative of f with respect to x is 1, and that has to equal lambda times the partial derivative of g with respect to x, and the partial derivative of g with respect to x is 2x. So we have 1 equals lambda 2x, and therefore a lambda has to equal 1 over 2x. Now we look at the um, other partial derivative. With respect to y, it's also 1, and that has to equal lambda times the partial derivative of g with respect to y which would be lambda times 8y. So now when we set 1 equal to lambda 8y, we get lambda equals 1 over 8y. So if those are both equal to lambda, then they're equal to each other, transitive property of equality. So we set them equal, and we cross multiply, and we find out that x has to be 4 times y. So now we use the constraint, and we plug in um, 4y for x and solve that equation and we get a value for y and then x then is just 4 times the y value. So now we have our x and y value. We're going to go ahead and plug that into the function to find the uh, maximum minimum. Now if, if, if we want a maximum and we're just adding x and y then pretty obviously the maximum is just going to be the sum of the positives and the minimum then is obviously going to be the sum of the uh, negatives. Now, if it wasn't obvious, you would have to check all combinations thereof to see which number came out highest or lowest. So the maximum is at that point, and the value then ends up being root 5 over 2 when you do the arithmetic, and the minimum is just the sum of the negative values, so it occurs at the negative values of x and y, and the minimum value then of the function is negative root 5 over 2.
Number six, find the absolute extrema of this function subject to the constraint of this other function. Okay, so same idea. We take the partial derivative of x for f, which is 8x, and set that equal to lambda times the partial derivative with respect to x of the constraint, which is 2x. And then, so um, pretty obviously, either x is 0 or lambda could be 4. So there are other solutions, but we can't find them yet. Then we do the same thing for the partial derivative with respect to y. For f, it's 18y. And for the constraint, it's going to be 2y. And so again, either y is 0 or lambda is 9. So let's look at the constraint under the two circumstances. If x is 0, then that forces y to be plus or minus 1. On the other hand, if y is 0, then that forces x to be plus or minus 1. So basically, we have four possibilities. And so we have to try all these possibilities in the original function. And so plugging in 0, 1, we get 9. 0, negative 1, we also get 9. 1, 0 gives us 4. And negative 1, 0 gives us 4 also for the z value. And so guess what? The maximum is 9 and the minimum is 4, subject to this constraint. Number eight, find the absolute extrema of the function of three variables subject to the constraint x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. OK, so same thing. The uh, partial derivative with respect to x for f is 3. And for g, it's 2x. So we solve for lambda. Now do the same thing for y. The partial derivative for f is 2. The partial derivative for the g, the constraint function, is 2y. And so we get lambda equals 1 over y. And then finally for z, again, the partial derivative for f is 1, and the partial derivative for g is 2z. Solve for lambda. Now, lambda has to equal all of these. So what uh, you do is just solve this any way you wish. What I did was I set the first two equal, cross multiplied, and got y in terms of x. Then I took the first and the last and set them equal and got z in terms of x. So now I've got everything in terms of x. I can plug that into my constraint. So plugging into the constraint, collecting like terms, solving for x, we get plus or minus 3 over root 14. So then um, to get y, we just multiply by 2 thirds. And to get z, we just multiply by 1 third. And then again, uh, we don't really have to try all possible combinations, thank goodness, because there would be 2 times 2 times 2. There would be 8 possible points we'd have to check. But pretty obviously, since the function f is linear, the maximum is going to be the sum of the positives, and the minimum is going to be the sum of the negatives. So if we just plug into our function, we get a maximum of root 14 and a minimum of negative root 14. Number 16, find the absolute extrema of this function of three variables subject to two constraints, x squared plus y squared equals 1 and 2x plus 2y plus z equals 5. So first, let's identify our constraint functions, g and, and h. And since the theorem says they have to equal 0, we have to bring the 1 and the 5 over, although it really doesn't matter because in the derivatives, those will go to 0. And instead of separate uh, equations this time, I'm going to build one equation because the partial derivatives of f have to then equal lambda times the partial derivatives of g plus some other constant, which I'm going to call mu, times the partial derivatives of h. And so um, obviously, this could get uh, very complicated. And so the textbook is keeping everything simple. So here are the partial derivatives of f, g, and h, respectively. And so they're quite simple. Now we can build three equations using the first components, the second components, and the third components. And here are our three equations. Now, if we look at that last equation, pretty obviously mu is 1. And um, from the first two equations, we can see that x and y have to be equal. And so now we can plug into um, e either of our constraints, and I chose the first one. We can plug x in for y and solve for x, and then we know that y is the same value. And then finally, we can use our second constraint to find the z value. And so I just plugged in twice x plus twice y plus z equals 5. 
which means z is 5 plus or minus 2 root 2. Now, again, obviously the, the, um, the max and the minimum here are pretty obvious since the function is only equal to z. We don't have to test a whole bunch of numbers. We know immediately that the maximum is 5 plus 2 root 2 and the minimum is 5 minus 2 root 2. Number 24. Use a method of Lagrange multipliers to solve problem number 32 from section 12.5. Those were the minimax word problems. And so the problem number 32 was to find the point in the first octant on the surface described by x, y, z equal 8 closest to the origin. So to use this method, we think of the x, y, z equal 8 as the constraint, and then the function we want to um, minimize because it's closest, so we want to minimize the distance. And that's not very convenient, so instead we minimize the square of the distance, which would give us the same x, y, and z values. So uh, the partial derivative with respect to x has to equal lambda times uh, the partial derivative of the constraint with respect to x, and the same thing for the partial derivative with respect to y which is 2y has to equal lambda times the partial derivative with respect to y of the constraint and so on. And for each of those three we solve for lambda. And since lambda has to be the same throughout we can set those first two equal which I did and then cross multiplied and solving that we get x equal y and then set the second two equal cross multiply and that gives us z equal to y. And so now we can plug um, x in for y and z in our constraint, and x has to be 2. And so the point on this surface closest to the origin is 2, 2, 2. Number 34. Use the method of Lagrange multipliers to solve problem number 42 in section 12.5, another wordy problem. And this one was a closed box with a volume of 12 cubic meters and the material of the bottom costs twice as much as the material for the top and the sides. Find the dimensions that minimize cost. So here's a picture of our box and our constraint is that the volume has to be 12 and what we're trying to minimize is the cost function. So we double the uh, double two times the uh, area of the bottom and then um, the top is xy, just regular price, and then we have two sides that are xz and two sides that are yz, and so then if we uh, combine like terms we get 3xy plus 2xz plus 2yz. So our derivative with respect to x of the cost function equals lambda times the derivative with respect to x of the constraint, same thing for the partial derivative of y, the partial derivative with respect to z, and solving for lambda this time, our algebra is going to be a little bit more complicated, but not too bad. So now we have three expressions for lambda, and I'm out of space on this slide. So we're going to repeat these on the next slide. And then I'm going to set the first two equal and cross multiply. And that cancels, and so pretty obviously x has to equal y. This is the same thing over and over again because the book has to keep it simple or you wouldn't be able to do the algebra. And then the second two lambda expressions set equal cross multiplied gives us 3y equals 2z. So z is equal to 3y over 2. So now we have everything in terms of y. So we take our constraint function and we replace x and z with their expressions in y and we can solve for y and y is 2. And then we can go back up here and since x is equal to y, x is 2 and then for z we multiply y by 3 halves. So there's our answer. The dimensions that minimize the cost are a base of 2 meters by 2 meters and a height of 3 meters. So now I leave you with another interesting set of surfaces and it's your turn to work the problems in 12.9.